Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time you are joining us. We are so excited to be here for Coping in Color, Black Mental Health uh, podcast that we are debuting during Black Mental Health Awareness. So in Canada, well, and I don't know how far we're going to get, but in Canada, it is Black Mental Health Awareness Week. And I am super excited to be, well, today's first co-host of this amazing, amazing podcast that's going to be your go-to place for mental health topics, conversations about Black mental health and where to get support wherever you are. I am Noreen Sibanda. I am a registered provisional psychologist based in Alberta, Edmonton. I'm also the executive director of the Alberta Black Therapist Network. And I am going to be taking you through today's journey. As we get started, I would like to introduce you guys to our lovely guest. And that is Rowan Higgins and she also goes by Blue River. So Rowan, I am that person that doesn't like people saying, hey, can you tell us about yourself? Because I feel like it's really awkward and it's the worst thing to like have to describe yourself. And I thought we will get to this in a different way without you having to like give us your bio, right? We have Google these days, just write her name, you will find all of those beautiful things that we write. But if we're in conversation, let's do it in a different way, right? So let's get to know each other in a different way. So I am um, going to ask you three questions. Mm -hmm. The first one being, uh, well, sorry, this dates me. So those, the people that will get it, they'll get it. There's a movie by Gwyneth Padro called Sliding Doors. And so it plays two scenarios in terms of how her life would play out. So it's based in the UK and she gets on the tube. If she makes it to that particular train, her life plays out differently than if she misses the train. What has been a sliding door moment for you that has changed the way your life has evolved and taken shape that has brought you to today? I'm sorry, it was a little connection issue. So you said, um, what is something, a sliding door moment that has changed my life? Yeah. Yeah. If you had made a decision, how would life have turned out versus based on the decisions that you made and how life has turned out instead? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. Hmm. What what, what was a sliding door moment in my life? Um, You know what? just saying yes at opportunities for maybe what seems like the smallest thing, but ends up being a pivotal moment. So being in an, at a cafe or as an event, uh, at McGill University, somebody was hosting and it was like a variety show, but there was an opportunity for a, an audience member to win a prize. And I mm. went on stage, I jumped up on stage to get the prize. And then they were like, you have to sing. And then I was like, absolutely not working with kids you know, my vocal cords were scratched to be so, so polite. And anyways, on the, on the spot, I end up performing, which would end up being therapy of a lifetime because the first time I was in the class, I found the scattered person that always had a smile on their face and end up speaking about um, mental health and really sharing my deepest thoughts that I didn't even know was something that I had pushed aside, which was my mother's mental health issue and then my sister as well. So that would be mm. it saying yes to that because it's opened many doors for me as a creative. I would have never yeah. thought of myself being a poet. It's allowed me to yeah. address issues that are seen taboo in society or things that we don't talk about, especially in, um, you know, amongst the diaspora, the African diaspora, you know, especially with uh, Caribbean heritage. Like, so yeah, I would say that. Yeah. Well, wow. Amazing. Saying yes changed everything. So. Yeah. To everyone listening, uh, saying no is also saying yes to something else, right? Because that's the idea of the sliding door moment, right? That opportunity opens up different things. So I know you're based in Montreal. I also didn't disclose this prior. I lived in Montreal. (laughs) Right? I was like, oh, this is uh, a connection. Mm -hmm. So growing up in Montreal, how does a... 
a black female end up saying, this is a career that I'm picking up, being a poet, being a spoken word poet on mental health, we're knowing how much mental health continues to be a taboo in our community and how much our career choices tend to be very limited <laughs> to the general doctor, lawyer, maybe accountant if you're lucky. How did that journey come about for you? Oh, for sure. Well, first, um, as a young person, work, um, you know, I was in the system. I was in foster care because of my mother's mental health issues. I knew I wanted to speak up and be a voice for other young people who were what they deem at risk and see them for as, pro mm -hmm. as for promised youth and speak life into them. So I actually thought I was going to be a nurse first. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that just pivoted real quick. And I ended up being in counseling. So uh, working in group homes and schools, I, I knew that I wanted to help young people. Mm -hmm. So poetry and besides drawing, I didn't think being an artist was going to be my thing. I did love to express myself creatively. So that happened, like I said, in that moment and being called upon to do that. So that's how the artistry part, uh, you know, carved its way. So now I'm at a point in my life where they're at meeting points uh, in the last few years, especially in the pandemic, where I was asked to perform a lot more and speak on mental health. And that became, you know, again, like a sliding door where you're saying, like, wow, because of these decisions, now they've intersected and I've been able to speak, not only just speak life for young people, but for men and women, those who are incarcerated and just continue to plant seeds in that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned counseling, which um, for people listening, this takes a few different shapes. So counseling for you was uh, being the person that you wanted to see when you were growing up having that person that would have an understanding and lived experience. So where were you doing most of your counseling? So um, just, to, just to be clear, I studied a special care counseling. Um, so as an educator in the front, doing frontline work in schools mm -hmm. and, you know, group home detention center and community work and street work. So that was just me revved up all the time. And I'll, I'll bring that up after just doing crisis work. When I did it well, mm -hmm. I knew how to show up and wear the cape, you know? <laughs> so doing that that work in itself, I left no room for myself for my own healing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then when I go back of why, it's because I had social workers um, or, or guidance counselors who were like, you will never be this, or you have 10% chance of having schizophrenia like your mother, where they were transferring labels. Mm -hmm. And I found it weird and I found it very strange and... Um, totally unprofessional even as a teenager i knew this is not what you're supposed to do it's like did you know you have 10 percent mm. chance of having what you you're genetically predisposed to have what your mother had I'm like is this what we Whoa. do and i realized a lot mm. of us young people were being misunderstood misdiagnosed mm -hmm. and uh yes. we're not being we're being misrepresented um so yeah. that's where i said i want to get into frontline work anything whether um I, and at the time, I just said, I don't want to be a social worker because I had such a bad mm. experience. experience. And now here I am full circle <laughs> working in that field, uh, and, well, focusing on, on social work in itself and what we can do on another level. Yeah, well, and I'm hearing in order to change the system, we kind of need to be part of it. And changing it takes different forms, right? It's correcting some of these uh, misconceptions about uh, what mental health is, right? Mm. So I'll take us to that. What is your understanding of mental health and how would you define the role of mental health in your life? Mental health to me, wow. I'll say this very softly. I, I feel like mental health is a glitch in time in many ways. Mm. And I'll explain. I feel for me, what as a child, I was in the front, I had front row seats of watching family members and later on friends and coworkers experiences. And it becomes this glitch because it's misunderstood, it's taboo, it's not addressed uh, properly. And from province to province, we see how different that is. In Quebec, it's still a challenge to get people the support they need. The beds are mm. full in hospitals. Um, I was asked to be on a focus group at a hospital where doctors, especially during the pandemic, were like, we're having a challenging time addressing black families because they see it as taboo. They see it as a voodoo, all the oo's, you know, and it's like, 
And I'm like, you're asking me. And then I had three family members in that moment who were in the hospital where I feel like I cannot speak for them because of the way the mm -hmm. laws are set up, where they're not sharing information. So I feel, you know, it is something that interrupts our lives, whether you're the person that's diagnosed, dealing with it, undiagnosed, mm -hmm. or a family or a loved one or a friend or even an observer of watching somebody's mm -hmm. social, psychological, and their emotional, even spiritual life just take it's, it, I say glitch, but it's bigger than that, you know, and it's affecting their mm -hmm. life, how they're feeling, how they're acting in their ways, everything. And it's just not being addressed. And we know it could affect people at any, any time of their lives. And I think it's really important mm -hmm. for us to have that support. So I'd say a glitch in time for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and Well, and we know one in five Canadians will experience a mental health uh, ish concern at some point in their life. Right. And I like to make the distinction that it is you experience at some point in your life, whether, like you said, from a family member directly or you're seeing people that you support go through it. So mental health is something that's part of our daily lives. We all have mental health is the first thing. And then mental health disorders is when that disruption that you were talking about mm -hmm. arises because it has an impact on your parenting ability, your work ability, everything else that you get to do. If you're not well mentally, then nothing else is going to work out, right? Exactly. And we know the system in place is really struggling between that mental health, which is maintaining your ability to deal with things versus when things have gone really wrong, right? Mm -hmm. The system tends to want to respond then, whereas there's a lot that can be done from that preventative and community-based ways of things. And I think this is where some of your work, your spoken word comes into, where you're highlighting for people ways in which taking care of your mental health is part of your daily life. It's not a, something has gone wrong, now do something. It is something that we do ongoing. Um, can you share a little bit about why that distinction is important for you to make? Of, of how we deal with mental health and how we, I would say, you know, and I was about to ask him the question, but uh, I see mental health as like an instrument of being tuned you know, like the strings mm -hmm. on an instrument, like making sure we're in tune every day with our well-being, our emotions, our spiritual life, our physical. And, you know, mm -hmm. we tend to hear a lot of people say, you know, we need to just find work-life balance. I'm like, no, there's some mm -hmm. things that we, right, we might be out of sync, but how can we find harmony in everything that we do? Still a challenge, mm -hmm. but it, it may be just like, am I drinking my water? It's like every step. Uh, however, when it just totally comes out of sync, when it's totally off yes. track making that distinction is really like you know what i'm no longer functioning i'm no longer feeling okay i'm no longer feeling mm -hmm. whether i belong or feel safe or just feeling like i'm grounded um yeah and so i think that distinction is very important for people to understand for that's you're totally right i think in all of our lives there will be a time whether through grieving or being unemployed losing a job that there's this mm -hmm. you know our mental health is taking a hit right but yep. that distinction is, is very important for sure of how it's affecting us and even our choices from there, you know, moving forward. And then we might need support to intervene, to assist us because we can no longer function properly. We're no mm -hmm. longer in harmony, you know? Yeah. Well, and I like that uh, image of the instrument. If you tune, then you know what's going on, right? And also, you know when to seek out the supports that you need, right? Yes. And I find that is probably one of the challenges in our community where people struggle to reach out for help or supports. Why do you think that continues to be? Yeah, well, like I said, the, the, um, the misconceptions people have, the just the taboo. I've seen it uh, being in a faith-based institution, being in a church and someone was having a mental crisis and individuals are, were actually saying it was the, the devil, you know, and we see that in different mm -hmm. cultures. And it, it's, it's wild that even to this day, even to present day that people were like, I don't want to tell anyone because that's a disease that has no face. We don't understand mm -hmm. it. You look fine to me. What do you mean? Um, and yep. that has happened to me where I actually, um, 
was work went to my daughter's school and I told my daughter, just tell your teacher I'm not feeling well. I wasn't able to get the supplies in on time. And she told mm-hmm. my daughter, your, your mother looks fine to me. And I was like, Whoosh. <laughs> my daughter came back and told me this. And it was such a trigger because even though she didn't know what yeah. was wrong with me, but for her to say that, it just, mm-hmm. I felt like it unraveled the, the work that I've done for others in that moment. And this was my turn to like, be okay yeah. with not being okay and to get the help and not mm-hmm. lying to myself. And now you're doing that. So my daughter's questioning, yeah. you know, so, um, yeah. people in our misconceptions our misperceptions, the lies we've been taught, the things we need to unlearn. Yeah. Well, and as you share that story, I think it's highlighting the, the strong black woman, right? Uh, yes. we ought to show up regardless, right? And the world is just expecting us to do exactly that, right? Well, Instead like of... What you've been through. Exactly, right? Just because I do not carry my struggles, or I carry them differently, does yes. not mean I don't have any struggles, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and like you said, the lack of the face or having to see how that mental illness has an impact and I'm not saying the world doesn't have movies, books, and all of these things where people can read these things, but because we tend to ostracize the experiences or only see the extreme, we don't see how people are functioning with mental illness, right? And when they are able to do that, we tend to push them to the, you are normal spectrum instead of saying you're managing, right? Mm -hmm. And that managing piece is still part of the space that needs to be dismystified and having more conversations about that, right? I may not look like I have a broken hand, but certain things are not functioning. I'm not in tune with where I need to be. So um, you mentioned holding space for other people and creating the space where uh, people can be not okay. What are some of the ways in which you continue to do that? And also take it in the personal side. What do you do for yourself? Yeah, I'm going to actually start with that because that's what I'm learning to do. Um, <laughs> it's First of all, it's grounding myself, like anchoring. I've always been that, those people that are always constantly vibrating and just above the ground, not having my feet mm-hmm. centered. And mm-hmm. doing those self-checks, where am I, you know, making those declarations and not, you know, some people want to speak about toxic positivity and this and that. That's gotten me to be resilient and to survive. But what will it take for me to thrive is really just seeing if things are not okay, being okay, check yourself. Don't try to feel like, okay, I have to fix. Um, mm-hmm. And it's hard mm-hmm. when you're in the field, we've learned to fix well. Also when we've seen our mm-hmm. families, especially my aunt, my mom, mom who came through the domestic scheme and you're working in people's homes, you have three jobs, you're taking care of children, you know how to, so we also as this generation feel like, oh, I can't even, they're washing clothes by hand. They didn't have the washing machine. It's like mm-hmm. trying to keep up, not with the Jones and, but our Caribbean or, or African heritage. Yeah. It's like, this is a different generation. And just because they went, they had, they had to go through that. Why are we choosing That's to true. still be in that same survival mode? So for me, it's really mm-hmm. just, how can you ground? Is that prayer? Is yeah. that reading? Is that drinking water? Is that going for a walk outside? Is that taking deep mm-hmm. breaths? Like I realized for years, yeah. I wasn't even breathing correctly. I wasn't mm-hmm. taking time to ground. So even on a day off, I'm like, I need to do something to the point that you're home and mm-hmm. you can't relax. You can't nap. I had to rewire, I had to rewire that yeah. processing and holding space for others. I was very good at that. Mm. How I can best hold space for people now is holding space for me first. So it comes back mm. because I was Love very it. good. So for those who might be listening and you want to know how to hold space for others, it's listening intentionally and not trying to fill in the blanks and telling people what to do and how you can rescue them or what they can do mm. for that rescue mission. It's really listening. Mm-hmm intently and asking how can i assist you i'm here i hear you mm-hmm. not saying oh maybe it's just this and yeah or just comparing what they're going through it's like yeah me too and this and that we're very good at oh, that. Yeah. i call it ping pong so i'd say it's that holding mm-hmm. space in a very healthy way is intentional listening being a support and mm-hmm. asking if you can be a support making sure there's room for mm-hmm. that yeah i love the the breath in poetry that you are echoing right? Because a big part of spoken word is actually breathing, Mm -hmm. right? 
when you take breath, how you take breath makes a difference in how your delivery comes through. So I think, like we say, the sliding door was exactly setting you up to where you need to be yes. today. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the vibrations. We were constantly vibrating here in the doing. And I often have that same feeling and similar conversations around my circles as well about how do we rest? Do we know how to rest, right? I am also guilty of going on vacation and scheduling every single day with an activity or something to do. Uh, <laughs> and I justify it with, I need to see everything. But I also know it's part of that, not knowing what rest is. Right. And we can talk about those experiences of the parents go to work and they come back and they're like, what have you done all day? Dishes are not done. So we never get used to knowing what rest is. How are you resting for yourself and creating that space to rest amongst everything else that we have to deal with, everything that we're exposed to in the world right now, whether it's social media, trauma porn, knowing the intergenerational trauma that comes with it. How do you rest? First, I'll say, I love how you said that. And what came to my head translated is like, in the end, it's being okay with the unknown. Mm. Okay? And, and I'll speak, you know, for black, for black individuals who are dealing with mental health, uh, or who think we're okay, because we're very good at putting on that mask too and saying, I'm fine, I'm good, especially, but I want to speak even at, at, from the voice of a black woman, because I can only speak from that. That whole rest thing, um, being okay with being uncomfortable with even silence, with the calm, because a lot of us, mm. I'm not speaking for all, but I know I've been okay with chaos. Mm -hmm. This is what I knew and I'm comfortable so it's almost if like somebody asked you, do you want good news, bad news? Because all I know is bad news might give you the bad news first. Good news makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Compliments makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Rest mm -hmm. makes me feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable. So yeah. how can I learn to be comfortable with the with silence and rest and breathing and learn to go with ebb and flow of the water and not feel like I have to paddle and I know where I'm going. Can I be okay with mm. the chaos? Can I find calm in the chaos? And that is through grounding myself, right? That's mm -hmm. definitely painting the picture of like, okay, so what if you're in chaos? You've been in chaos before, right? You've mm -hmm. gone, you've overcome. But instead mm -hmm. of looking at overcoming and um, that surviving and resilient mm -hmm. and strong black woman, mm -hmm. rest to me is really anchoring in the unknown and being okay with yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and it's in the doing where we tend to find ourselves, right? And I think whether it is the identity that we've attached to the doing, that rest feels so foreign, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love, um, I love, I, if, I can, if I may add the doing thing, and I know we've heard this, you know, like we all know the human doing, but we have a challenge of the human being. And, you know, mm -hmm. the first two letters of being is B-E. That's the hard part. Cause we're so professional yeah. at doing, we've learned that since you're like a little child, like, what do you want to do when you, when you're older? But we right. actually ask, what do you, who do you want to be? But we end up knowing how to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just want to yeah. be, and I'm at the stage. I'm like, I just want to be period. Yeah. No time. Well, no also agenda, think... no to-do list. <laughs> yeah. And I also think when we ask that question, we only focus on the title, like you said, we focus on like, I want to be a lawyer, but what does that actually mean? What is being a lawyer, right? Because beyond the title and whether it is the admin work or whatever that it needs, but what is being, right? The, are you advocating, right? Because that's what lawyers do. Are you advocating? Can you advocate in a different space where it's not necessarily attached to that? right? And shifting that conversation to being, when you want to be this, this is what it would come with. And is that something that aligns with you being in tune with yourself and all of these layers of ourselves, right? There isn't a class about being, although I think there should be one, right? Yeah. That, that is the most 
different one because it has an impact on everything else that we're going to be doing. So before we take a break in a few minutes here, I was very excited to ask you this question because a big part of spoken word is the choice of language that you use. So how is language important in identity and how does it shape one's worldview and potentially the lived experience that they echo? How is language important in identity and shaping identity? Yep. And how does it shape one's point of view, worldview? Wow. Powerful. That's poetry in itself, that whole question. <laughs> um, I would say, like, like you said, um, breath. Just the fact that we can express. And mm -hmm. when people hear creativity, many times people link it, associated with the arts, right? With dance. And like, mm -hmm. are you a creative person? No, I used to draw. Like, creativity is, is, is an expression. Creativity is mm -hmm. finding a solution. It's an mm -hmm. answer and response, right? It's the call and answering back. And that to me is what language is. Whether that's through movement, whether that's through food, whether that's through music, um, finding solutions, you know, like, you know, you're cold and season, then you invent a, a winter coat. Like, okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's the creative response. And language is mm -hmm. that. Because one-sided, it, it, it goes into empty ears. As a poet, if I didn't have an audience or someone to hear me, the receive mm -hmm. and send, that's the real shaping of the identity. And going back to the being part, when I mm -hmm. introduce myself to you, I might say my name. And the next question we say, so what do you do? Mm -hmm. Right? And I feel part of language is just learning to connect with compassion, mm -hmm. learning to, to lean in and stay plugged in into communicating with others, but also communicating with ourselves and for those mm -hmm. who believe a higher power, right? And I think that shapes our identity and releasing the scripts or the roles that we've been, or I would say the labels that society has put mm -hmm. out there is like, well, you need to do this. By the time you're 20 mm -hmm. something, you need to be adults and you need to have these things. And we're forgetting mm -hmm. to be, and our language copies that. Right. Yeah. So when I think of mental yeah. health, the moments that I've had my meltdowns is when my expectations were not aligned with reality. Mm -hmm. Right. You lose that job or like at this age or people are like, I thought I'd be married at this. I thought I'd have a child by then. Again, it's the scripts of others that we've taken on mm -hmm. as our own language. And then we realize that, OK, I'm speaking in tongues right now. This is this is not making sense. <laughs> This is, another, yeah. this is another dialect. Instead of living in the mm -hmm. moment and being okay with where we're at, like you said, the sliding door. And it shapes yeah. our worldview based on the language that we're hearing, the words, the verbiage, the imagery, like you said, the trauma porn, telling our children, mm -hmm. no, don't do that. The anxiety that we instill in that, you need to do this. You need to show up to work twice as early, Noreen. You need to leave later. You can't wear that. Your hair can't be natural. That programming becomes mm -hmm. our language, becomes our worldview, and shapes then shapes our identity. And it affects the meaning that we make of the world. Yeah, right? And the expression piece really resonated with me. So I just want to take a quick minute break here, and we'll be back <laughs> with more. <laughs>
welcome back. We are in Coping in Color, Navigating Mental Health, uh, Black Mental Health podcast. I'm joined by Rowan Hedgens, and we're just having a conversation about Black mental health experiences working in the field, but also personal experiences that have uh, f influenced how she sees the world and how she engages with spoken word and poetry. So if you're joining us for the first time, there's 30-ish minutes that you have to go back and listen to. They have been amazing. We have been talking how mental health has an impact on individuals and ways in which we can find space to just breathe. My name is Noreen and I am based in sunny Edmonton. You can probably see the rays on my face and Rowan is joining us from North Montreal. So here's my uh, other get to know you question. Yes. If you could only listen to one type of genre of music, what would it be and why? Well, to tell you the gospel truth. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, um, yeah, gospel music for me has been a saving grace. And I mean, that was the whole purpose of it for, for well, starting with Negro Spirituals, a history of getting people to freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they came out of freedom, it came to freedom rather. It's like they're singing it to get to financial freedom, economic freedom, if you will, mm -hmm. um, mindset freedom. Yep. So whether it's from Mahalia, the Clark sisters, Mary, Mary, that genre has till this day just just aligns me, just brings me back to being grounded and, and allows me to tap into my emotions because I love mm. R&B, I love hip hop, but especially like, especially hardcore beats. I love instrumental beats. Yeah. I'm very good at avoiding my emotions already and just being <laughs> where gospel is like oh it just open it takes off my bulletproof vest is one of my poems you know it's like yeah. it takes off that shield that i've learned to wear so well that all is well mm -hmm. it's like no it gets you have no choice to with tap it. into your emotions you know yeah it's you to sit with it and i think that is one of the reasons why i appreciate music with meaning right because now I have to take myself into that space that I connect with what's being said, right? Because you can't just listen to it and not hear, right? Once you've heard something, it's going to have an impact on you. And it's definitely timeless. So, definitely timeless. It is timeless. It does stand the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one kind of brings us back into uh, the work that you do. So... When I looked at some of your work, I realized that there's everything that you express through words, but also there's the nonverbal cues that are also there to echo some thoughts. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit more about how you navigate that or even put those in place to say, this is communicating something without me having to use a word to bring it to life as well? Girl, I grew up with Jamaican <laughs> folk, these Caribbean folk, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, of uh, African ancestry being very expressive in our nonverbals. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you know. Um, so, yeah, do I do it intentionally? Not at all. It's how I communicate. It's how, you know, when you think of uh, our West African uh aunties and, and, and uncles, you know, it's like that. Who are you talking mm -hmm. about? Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Let's try this again, right? So it has traveled <laughs> down no matter where we are in the diaspora. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's very, we're very, I find many people, I can't speak for all black people, just growing up very mm -hmm. animated and where things are like, you just know that look, you're speaking when you're not mm -hmm. supposed to speak or you're talking back up or, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like, did I did I catch you right? Like, oh, you know that means something. Yeah. yeah. Whether you say rewind, select, or come again, I didn't get that. I didn't catch that. Mm -hmm. right. You know, but without saying it, um, we saying it. Uh, so yeah. yeah, it's just that's very natural. Um, it's embedded in condition, and, and it's one of the things that, as you know, in counseling, we learn not to use so much. You know, and I remember when I was studying two decades ago, I used to get in trouble. They're like your hands. <laughs> 
So all the black <laughs> people and the Italians, we had to do it over and over because our yeah. hands and our gestural would yeah. so much. <laughs> I say, excuse my face. It doesn't know what to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's doing aerobics. So, but, so. Right, it's doing its own thing. But I highlight that to say that's a big aspect of the mental health experience, right? So there's a lot of things that don't get communicated, but they get echoed in different ways, right? So mm. when we see people that show up to work, but they're not doing well, that's also communicating something, right? Yeah. Because often we just want to wait for someone to say, I'm struggling. Mm. There are ways in which that takes place without us having to hear the words, right? You uh, gave us an example about church. If someone is often showing up to church and then there's a day that they don't or they show up, but they don't look like themselves, that's a way of getting to have those conversations. And it had me wanting to ask, what are ways in which people can begin to have conversations about mental health or addressing those concerns that they see from their loved ones? You probably didn't get someone to tell you that your mom um, had a mental illness, but there were things that you would see around you that were saying something is different from my home than other people. Yeah, I, I think the most important, I know I mentioned this already, I touched on it with the listening intently first, mm -hmm. um, but also listening to receive, to hear something back, you know, because we're very good at like, how are you? But are we really there and present enough to receive what the person's going to say? Because when we sense that, that it's just like, you're just saying it because we've been programmed. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. That's good. Right? Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Yeah. How's your soul doing mm -hmm. today? And somebody says, I'm fine. I don't know. How are you really doing? And I actually do a rating scale where I ask people like from one to 10. <laughs> and then they realize, yep. oh, wait, because we've also learned not to really answer honestly. Because I guess yes. that's ping pong. We're like, I'm fine, even when we're not. So mm -hmm. sometimes I know I've had people say, but why didn't you say something was okay? not okay? Why didn't you call? I'm like, I was not even able to reach out. Mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. you said, sometimes it takes that person to say, to do a real temperature check and check in. Yeah. Not just check in. Yeah. Check in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and it's the part where you say, I've noticed, I've seen that this is different, what's going on? And I'm with you. I, the people that I work closely with, they get the, I'm here. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm here right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. I'm worried in the background, what's for dinner? What time am I picking up my son? All of these things are happening. So I'm not going to say I'm okay when I'm not. Because then I am doing that thing we said about language, right? We're adopting uh, what we've been told to say, I'm okay, because it is the pol politically correct thing and the polite thing to say, right? But it's never truly about how we're doing. So then when we ask people, when was the last time someone checked in with you or on you? We're like, I don't really know because we don't do that. And this mm -hmm. is probably what Yes, and we've been taught to leave things at the door, whether it's our job. I grew up that way too. Mm -hmm. When you come in here, leave everything at the door. Don't come in with that face and leave your, you know, it, mm -hmm. drop it. And our jobs, we, and if we're parents or, you know, you're like, I don't want to bring this energy in my home. So we put on that mask again. So how many masks mm -hmm. are we actually putting on? And when do we actually even mm -hmm. get to take off the layers? Um, so yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question. And, and it takes, it takes a lot for us to, effectively connect uh in a way yeah. that's genuine um mm -hmm. and and be there or say you know what i'm you have my undivided attention like put down the phone listen say okay mm -hmm. what's going on and you hear that i'm gonna put everything down let me call give me two minutes and just make sure you're so I can present. Be present. yes yeah be definitely there. and i know if you joined us hoping to get labels about this is what this is i really apologize <laughs> um one of the things that i found in common between our work is the fact that we really reject the ideas of labels because they don't really don't have any value one but also it is not doing decolonized mental health care right it is the labels are for the professionals they know what it means it gives them xyz steps to follow Whereas 
most of our work is being trauma informed, but also being quite culturally safe and responsive in what we actually need instead of just that whole doing without being present with what's going on. So with that said, I'm wondering, are there ways in which we can continue to also destigmatize mental health and decolonize the supports that are in place? Oh, yes. Um, I would first say having conversations like this, having forums, having our own conferences, uh, inviting mm -hmm. other people in the, uh, who are working in the front line, no matter what their background, to understand and hear. Um, because many times we've, we've heard uh, people in the field who misdiagnose because of misunderstandings of our, you know, our culture, mm -hmm. our traditions, and, and maybe not understanding how the family dynamics uh, either mm -hmm. have a way of wanting to support or also are going through that unlearning process. So I definitely say yeah. conversations um, for our creatives, our influencers, whoever's out there, our thought leaders, You can be on camera and, and they're crying and, and you know, it's very, uh, you know, uh, trauma bonding mm -hmm. in many ways. And, and then people are just, this is mm -hmm. me and this is my label. Like, no, like you said, beyond this umbrella of labels, letting people uh, bring an awareness of where we can go, what to do, what those steps look like, how we can assist someone else who's having, we, we feel or believe is going through a mental mm -hmm. health crisis or we see a decline. Where, what doors yeah. do we knock on? Who are those individuals that can support us? Where is that safe space? Um, and we've seen it since the pandemic of people really crying out for, you know what, I want to finally go for therapy, but I need a therapist yeah. that looks like me. That's for my community, yeah. that I don't have to explain the nuances and the this and my, that I'm not being aggressive because I'm speaking a certain way. And that is so mm -hmm. powerful. I felt that shift said a lot that people were like, I am, desperate now for help but i am not that desperate mm. to put myself in a situation that's going to make me unravel even more uh and to see yeah. people putting lists together uh we did one in montreal as well uh mental health practitioners that you could reach out to from the black community of just yeah i think that's really important is where to go who to go to and making it accessible to everyone and knowing those steps mm -hmm. well and i like the shift from we're no longer just saying these are jobs we're saying this is where you can get the help that you need for xyz right and we are recognizing that in order for us to show up to the jobs or the things that we do we need to be okay right and when we seek out supports we want supports that are going to be culturally safe hear us see us and also be for us by us right Right. When it is not meant for you, you don't last, right? Because mm -hmm. that safety is out. You don't last because you don't feel like you're being seen or you're being heard or you have to perform to be. One of the things that I love when I work with uh, uh, women, Black women from the Black community is when they can show up in their bonnets for therapy, and they're like, oh, I knew it was you. I'm like, I don't, I'm not even seeing the bonnet. I'm just here to have a conversation. Let's catch up. Let's do this. So that's not the thing I'm even seeing in the first place, right? Because <laughs> that's not an important part of you showing up, right? Because I don't have the expectations for you to show up X, Y, Z. But also it speaks to how we have been conditioned and socialized to saying, when we show up to these professional spaces, we show up this way, partly because again it's not a space for us by us so then we don't have that safety that would come with i'm just going to show up in my bonnet mm -hmm. i'm like yeah my braids are halfway done but i made it to therapy i'm like i'm glad you made it right mm -hmm. that wasn't the reason for you to like not show up is my hair is halfway uh complete but you showed up that's really important with that are there any other community supports that you want people to know about and be uh, aware of or even some of the ways in which they can get to work with you 
well, because I know this is going to be streamed on an international scale, I will say <laughs> we all need to do the work and find out, like plug in, lean in and plug in into what's really out there in your community, um, in our faith-based organizations, in those community centers, uh, and um, mm -hmm. make those connections. And be bold. If you have a general practitioner or uh, even your osteopath, ask people, like, do you know of a, uh, you know, a therapist? And if you're looking for someone that is, looks like you or you want a referral for a, a loved one or someone you care about, ask those questions, mm -hmm. put it online. You'd be amazed. You know, if you make that Facebook post, mm -hmm. making, looking for uh, someone, a recommendation, those recommendation posts are amazing. You'd be amazed at what you find. And because now it's someone in your circle, they're referring to this person helped me. Um, this, this person has changed my life and I feel it's pivotal to go fish, put it out there. And um, yeah. it, I don't think we can go wrong with that, you know? No, no, we cannot, right? Ask and maybe you will get a response, <laughs> right? Yeah. The worst that could happen is you stay without the response, but at least you started the, the conversation. And part of that is having these conversations that are meeting people where they are. It's not about uh, pathologizing individuals or putting people into boxes, but simply creating a space for these conversations to be normal for us to continue to have. So we are open for some questions. Hello? Sure. I have, I have a short one on mental health, literally. <laughs> the first one I did. Okay. All right. We'll get you to do one and then I'll check on the questions. Um, and we'll answer the questions after you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So um, this is actually the piece that... Uh, I impromptu <laughs> brought on the stage without uh, mm. the sliding door one. <laughs> that part, I love it. You know, <laughs> I'll be giving you credit. I'm gonna be a poem girl. Thank you. <laughs> so, I just quick backstory. Like I said, I was um, my mom, mental health issues. My sister, and my sister still hospitalized for twenty plus years in a mental health institution. My mom was just discharged in the, the Christmas. So it's a revolving door. So this poem still holds a lot to my heart. I pray for an intervention so divine. When I heard you were robbed of your unconscious intelligent mind, uttering words that appear to have no comprehensive meaning, but to open ears, you just expressing your mixed feelings. Hearing voices when no one has even spoken in your head, provoking, choking, stopping you from breathing, no escaping. Can't close the doors for one quiet moment because verbal attacks are coming back like a rejected token. I see you on bended knees asking for atonement, thinking you've done wrong, send it to this cruel punishment, trapped in your own mind, like a detained attention, breaking out just became your main intention, redemption. I've come to the realization you're a beautiful person with a purpose, your talents are so profuse, stumbling over your confusion, which the devil left behind after his rude intrusion. Heavenly Father, please provide a resolution. I pray this uninvited guest will leave when the sun sets and when it rises over your horizon, you be blessed and darkness ceases to exist, evil under arrest. Lift your head up, let him heal his child with a kiss. How many of us have taken time to listen to our soul who's been trapped between the walls of depression? How many of us reach out and realize that shades of madness is camouflage intelligence? How many of us has been told to go for a psychological assessment because we do not conform to the norms of society? Well, baby love, I overstood your madness when I heard you in a corner crying, singing. This is insanity, living with split personality, crazy, seeing everybody so shady. How come everyone is ignoring me? Is this a conspiracy? Free, free life, free your mind. Free your mind. I pray the sun invite I guess we'll leave when the sun sets. And when it rises mm. over your horizon, you'll be blessed. Darkness ceases to exist. Evil under rest. Lift your head up, let them heal you with a kiss. Free your mind. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
I I have a million questions, but I will sit with it. <laughs> I will sit with it. Thank you again for that. So we do have a question which kind of aligns with something that we had been talking about. When are the best moments to get real and vulnerable about how we feel in our community? She notes that she's noticed that joy is welcome and distress is avoided. Mm. We don't always have the opportunity to speak with professionals at a crisis moment. Instead, later, right? Uh, this is like life is not that bad. When it gets bad and the neglect comes to play, we're very alone, despite having a community around a family or a partner. Uh, that's such so well said. Um, because I'm a person that speaks a lot. I can speak to anybody. You can speak to a stranger. But yes, when we get to that point at our lowest, you don't even know who to turn to. And it's like your brain is telling you, you know, sometimes like, don't even bother. Don't burden somebody. I don't want to stress them out. Our brain is telling us mm -hmm. all these things. That becomes a wall. Um, but I would say is we have to break past it first it's in our mind the most control if you have the most energy just a thought to say i can get through this just mm -hmm. that thought and and then trying your best to reach out because i know when you're deep down in that it's so hard to just say you know like at and back and it's like reach out and, and touch somebody it's the same thing it's like it is a challenge when you get there uh, it's easier said than done but reach out to someone that you can trust that you feel safe with. And sometimes it's not someone you know, because I know that's challenging mm -hmm. as well. It's go for that support. We have our hotlines. We have, um, if it's calling those clinics, a walk-in clinic, um, you know, and making it urgent. Because I know Canada, we're having a lot of problems finding even our doctors and clinicians. Waiting lists mm -hmm. are long. Keep knocking mm -hmm. on doors. Keep reaching out. And speak to someone you can trust that can help knock those doors for you. Yeah. And like when you can't advocate for yourself, having someone else to do that becomes important. I, I've been thinking about when we get to community or it's an event, we can hug each other. We can say hello. And for whatever reason, we're just like, I'm good, good, I'm good, good. But I also think those are beautiful, intimate moments that even if you are in a group setting, when you're in a hug with someone, you can say, hey, I'm not doing so well today. Can we have a moment, mm -hmm. right? And that's the person that you feel safe with, right? We're not going to say that to everyone, but I think the moment will never be right, but we have to create the moment to do that, right? That, yeah. Because when something goes well, we can stand up, we can pick up the mic and say, I've been able to make it to that program that I wanted to but also we have to have the time and take away the shame that comes with asking for help mm -hmm. and also be okay with um, knowing that sometimes when we do reach out, it might be three doors down that we get the support that we need. So we just have to continue to do that. And I think that's the advocacy piece that you were noting. Uh, I am glad that we've had people come in join us and be part of this conversation this is just the beginning rowan i cannot thank you enough for your vulnerability for your opportunity to just open up and share and also sharing your work that you do and your journey that has taken you thus far we hope to see more from you we know it's the beginning and as i mentioned this is just the first uh, episode of Coping in Color, Navigating Black Mental Health, brought to you by Black Mental Health Canada. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram at blackmentalhealthcanada.ca. And we're here to help you navigate Black mental health. And as we continue to celebrate Black mental health awareness, take the time to check in with yourselves. Take the time to be at rest, to be at peace with not doing, and to remember that your mental health journey is exactly that, a journey that is ongoing. It's going to evolve. You're gonna miss some doors, but when you catch the right ones, it's all going to align. 
Rowan, I'm going to give you a few minutes to give us some closing remarks, just to leave people with something. For sure. Well, once again, thank you so much to yourself, uh, to Black Mental Health for, Can for Canada. And that's another resource. Family, keep checking in. You're doing the right thing by even plugging in here. But uh, just a reminder for us to take off the the expectations of others of society continuously be open to unlearning that we can find different mm -hmm. coping ways. And I think in, the name is, in, it's in the name of coping in color. There are diverse, there's a, such a, what might've worked yeah. for you even uh, two quarters ago may not meet, be what you need for the spring. So be okay with planting new seeds, be okay with the unknown and, uh, lean in to what's beautiful lean into being kind to yourself and unplug from those things that are toxic and de derailing you or maybe even distracting you from taking care of yourself it starts with self-care it starts with conversations like this and surrounding ourselves with people who who are willing to nourish and water us for us to flourish amazing thank you so much and this was copy in color navigating black mental health Oh,